This is a production of Cornell University Library. I'm really delighted to be here. I've attended several book chats before, and I thought, oh, that sounds like a cool thing to do, so I'm glad I have a chance to do that this time. Um, I want to introduce you to a book that we just published. It came out uh, a couple of months ago, Agriculture, Rural Development in a Globalizing World. This book has a particular uh, reason for having been put together. And that reason is Hans Binswanger. Some of you may know of Hans Binswanger. Hans Binswanger is an extremely distinguished agricultural and development economist. He is considered by uh, a large part of our profession as the giant in the field of agricultural economics. He's done tremendous work in this field, uh, pioneering work in various parts of agriculture development. Uh, but one thing very unique about Hans Binswanger was that he was not an academic doing just academic research. What Hans did was to take high quality, rigorous research and convert that to policy, and push it through policy implementation. And he did that for several decades, being at the World Bank. So he was an extremely highly regarded uh, academic economist, but not, not cloistered within the walls of academic institutions. So he was able to transcend from academia into real life policy making and really made a difference. So uh, we, several of us who were very strong collaborators, close friends of Hans, got together uh, a couple of years ago in Milan and we had a festress in his honor. And this book is the result of that festress, where all of us got together and we did some solid reviews and writings around the work that Hans has done over the years. And fortunately for us, Hans was able to see the book in print just a couple of months before he passed away. Hans died in uh, August of this year. So we were delighted that we had an opportunity to put this in his honor and that he was able to see that in print before he passed away. In, in more personal terms, Hans was an extremely close friend of mine. Uh, I first met him in 1975 when I was a summer intern at ICRASAT, uh, one of the CGIR centers that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And um, then I worked with him again at the World Bank for many years. And a lot of what I do, the way I think about life, the way I think about economics, has been shaped by him. And quite simply, I would not be standing here in front of you if it was not for him and the mentoring that he did to me. And similarly, my co-author, Gershon Feder, who recently retired from the World Bank after several decades in the bank, was also a very close friend and was mentored by Hans Binswanger also. So from both of our sides, We've been delighted to, to have this, uh, uh, to be able to give this honor for Hans Binswanger. Now let me describe what this book looks like. The book essentially is designed around five thematic areas. It's designed around the five big thematic areas that Hans Binswanger himself spent a lot of his career working on. So, and as you can see, these these areas transcend much of development economics, much of agriculture development economics. Starts with this whole area of intensification of agriculture, technical change. Then we move on to the political economy of agriculture policies. It's one of those topics that economists really try to figure out, but we don't, we're not as good at figuring out the po politics behind policy making. We're very good at figuring out the economics of it, 
but quite often the politics rules the day, as we know from watching news every day. Um, then the third area is community and institutions, where in the past, when, when I was in graduate school, much of the discussion was around how development theory and development design starts at the top and then trickles down to community. But more and more, much of the development discourse today is about empowering communities, having communities be part of the design of the development process, having communities govern the development process, et cetera. So this idea of community-driven development has taken on a whole life of its own. And the World Bank certainly was a big part of pushing that process. And, and that's something we, we, we will talk about also. Then the next big area in this book is more uh, related to the linkages between agriculture and other sectors, primarily looking at the linkage between agriculture and nutrition and health. You know, what, what's peculiar is most of the time, as agriculture scientists and as, as agricultural economists, we've not really thought about outcomes of agriculture beyond the agriculture sector itself. But the big outcomes of agriculture are in nutrition and in health and on the environment. And it's that linkages between sectors that's so crucial as you think about the future, and think about the future of the development process. And finally, we have a, a last part of this book, which is about the future of international organizations. So here we talk about the World Bank. And where does the World Bank go into the future? And the very last chapter is my favorite topic, which is what's the future of the CGIAR? Is there a future relevance for the CGIAR system? So that's the big, broad, uh, thematic uh, structure of this book. It's got about 17 chapters. And, and every single chapter has been written by an extremely renowned uh, economist, um, people of major global fame. And we were fortunate to get these, these extremely uh, renowned people into one room uh, to the conference and then to put this book together. So what I want to do now is I don't want to go chapter by chapter and talk about each chapter. What I want to do is pull out some of the big insights that this book comes up with. And I wish I gave this talk before we sent this book to publication because I would have rewritten the synthesis chapter very differently than the way it's written now. Uh, so maybe there's a need for an addendum piece after this. So let me go through and talk about the insights that come out of this. Well, the fir very first area of insights that come out of this book is about Africa and African agriculture. And the question is, why has Africa lagged behind in agriculture development? It's a question, that's a perennial question. That Africa lagging behind is something that we've talked about for 40 years now. My first book was published in 1987. Uh, and in my book, um, I, and it was a book about African agriculture and African farming systems and technical change. And there we talked about how Africa, why was Africa left behind in the Green Revolution process and what needs to happen to move it forward. And that was 30 years ago. And we're still talking about Africa in similar context. And so in this book, we try to bring this back uh, and talk about it some more, but try to put a different light to this topic. And we all know, uh, when we think about African agriculture, we say African agriculture is, is a low productive agriculture system. There's been very low adoption of modern technologies, and especially productivity enhancing technology, technical change has been limited. And many of us argue that part of the reason for that is Africa, unlike Asia, for a long time was a land abundant continent, very low population densities, the demand for intensification of agriculture, the demand for labor, for land productivity increases were limited, etc. 
Well, that may have been true uh, in the 80s and maybe in the 90s, but today there are large parts of Africa where population densities are similar to what Asia was you know, in 1960, at the start of the Green Revolution in Asia. So, by that criteria, we should be seeing the start of a Green Revolution in Africa already. And in some parts, you may be seeing some of that, but you could be seeing a lot more. And why aren't we seeing a lot more? And, and a big part of the reasons for why we're not seeing a lot more is because of poor investments in infrastructure, public good investments in roads, transport, irrigation infrastructure, all of these big, massive investments that Asia has seen, that large parts of Latin America have seen. Africa hasn't, hasn't seen that. Similarly, the public good research investments in crops that are important to the poor, such as millets and cassavas, etc., are much more limited compared to investments in rice and wheat and maize, etc. And those, again, are reasons that we, we talk about. It's something we know. But there's a, another reason why Africa is different. You see, Urbanization in Africa is going very, very rapidly today. It's growing as rapidly as you see urbanization in Latin America and in Asia. But there's a difference. The difference is that in Asia, urbanization happened as a process of structural transformation, as a process of growth in the agriculture sector that then led to increased incomes which were then moved into the urban sector. So capital formation happened in the urban sectors, the urban industrial sector, as productivity increased in the agricultural sector. So it resulted in a growth process where employment in the urban sectors happened as demand for goods and services and uh, came up with growth and in incomes of rural populations. And so that led to what economists call pull migration pull migration out of rural areas in order to meet the growing demand for non-agricultural goods by rural population. But in Africa, you see a very different type of migration. You see a push migration, where because productivity is so low in rural areas, because prospects for increasing incomes in rural areas are so low, that people start to move out into urban areas and move into urban slums. And you see this locus of poverty going from rural to urban poverty. And that's where you see this push migration, where people get pushed out of rural areas through desperation, et cetera. It's a very different type of transformation that's happened. And so because of that, you don't see the same demand growth for non-agricultural goods as you saw in Asia. And so because of that, you don't see the same employment growth. So the main sources of employment tend to be low-wage service employment rather than uh, industrial employment and higher-wage service employment, et cetera. So that's been a big difference between urban growth that took place in Africa relative to urban growth that took place in Asia. Now, the, 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 the fourth part of why Africa lags behind is if you look at these urban centers that are growing, large, part, large number of these urban centers are on the coast. And when they're on the coast, places like Lagos or Accra, etc., then if, if your populations are concentrated on the coast, then food policy makers have a choice. The choice of bringing food in from the outside or bringing food in from the interior of the country. If you have low productive agriculture system with poor infrastructure investments, then the cost of bringing food in from within the country into these urban centers becomes very high, and it becomes cheaper to import food in from the US, from Latin America, from Asia, et cetera. And that has a significant effect on the competitiveness of agriculture of domestic agriculture in Africa. And that continues to be a major problem today. And the only way you're going to solve this problem 
is massive investments in the fundamentals, massive investments in public good, uh, road infrastructure, transport infrastructure, irrigation infrastructure, etc. That's the only way you will turn this system around. But the amount of available funding for this type of investments has changed dramatically. It's become much, much smaller relative to what it was in the 60s and in the 70s. So that's, that's the Africa story that comes out in this book. Let me go to another insight that we, we work on here. Now, these insights come from several chapters. So if you're looking for them in one, sp one place in the book, you won't find it. But they come through trying to piece together messages that come from different chapters. So the next area is something that's very topical. People talk, have a lot of discussion about it. Is there a future for small farms, small family farms? In fact, in my class today, we had a debate about that also. Is there a future for small farms? So we know from the Green Revolution experience that small farms were an essential part of the growth process, that investing in smallholder agriculture resulted in, in food security improvement, income growth, uh, structural transformation that happened, etc. And one of the main reasons why that small farm investments made sense in Asia and in parts of Latin America was much of that the Green Revolution technology was scale neutral. You could get, apply the same seed fertilizer technology to small farms as you could to large farms. And that scale neutrality allowed you to invest in smallholder agriculture. But as agriculture becomes more capital intensive, then scale matters. So scale starts to matter as you try to integrate into the modern food uh, value chain, because you want to go in uh, to supply the urban markets, etc. There, small, being small puts you at a disadvantage. So scale matters when you think about post-production activities, post-harvest activities, uh, quality control, safety control, all of these uh, issues that are crucial as you move into value chain. Scale also matters as wage rates start to rise and as you start to see mechanization of different agricultural operations. So as scale starts to matter, then you begin to say, how do I achieve, how do I achieve that scale? Well, part of the response that several countries have given is, OK, let's go for large scale farming. Well, the alternative that we discuss here is you don't have to do large scale farming. The way you can achieve scale is through creating um, uh, uh, an aggregate structure where small farms become part of a producer group that works together, that creates the scale at the farm level uh, across several farms, where each farm can still be an independent unit but working within that producer group gives you the scale both on the production side and on the uh, post-production side also in terms of aggregating and connecting into the value chain. And the book goes through and discusses several examples of how this is done and the ways in which it happens. And that just thinking about scale is no reason why we should abandon smallholder agricultural support that we can continue supporting smallholder agriculture, uh, even while trying to access the benefits of scale. Let me go to the next uh, insight, uh, which is around land rights, land rights for smallholder farmers. Again, anybody who's been working in development economics knows that not having secure rights to land means that you don't make the investments that are necessary for enhancing the productivity of that land. And that you're, you wouldn't make that investments if you don't have security of tenure, either in terms of ownership or tenancy rights, et cetera. We know this. And we know that many, many countries have, over the past well, couple of decades, started to put in 
tenancy rights and ownership rights, etc. But there's a problem. It's one thing to pass a law saying that there are ownership rights, and it's another thing to actually implement that. Because to go farm to farm and identify the boundaries of the farm, and then uh, clarify any disputes within the neighborhood that it's your farm and not somebody else's farm, and then codifying that information and then providing you with a title is an expensive proposition. So there's a big gap, an implementation gap, as they call it, between the laws around land reform, land tenancy, and the actual implementation of the ground. Now, one of the things that is now making that much easier is that you now have new tools. You have modern ICT tools, you have satellite imagery tools, et cetera, that dramatically reduce that implementation gap, that reduce the cost of implementing these programs. And in this book, we go through and talk about some of the big changes that are happening there and how, because of modern technology, you're able to take on a very fundamental governance problem and address that uh, governance problem in terms of land rights. But you also find that because you've got these technologies, you can also identify where land grabbing is going on. And you're able to, as civil society, be, be a much bigger voice in in, in the land grab discussion, to be able to say, we can see from satellite imagery that there are these areas which have been taken over for certain production purposes or given to certain companies, etc. Now, giving a piece of land to a company by itself is not an issue. The issue is if, if such land is acquired and then nothing happens with it, if you just hang on to it for 10 years and still not produce or use it for any productive activity. And one can check that with satellite imagery. So the modern tools have actually changed the way we look at land governance and land management. And that can potentially have a major impact looking ahead in overall land investments and land productivity improvement. Another insight, um, Rebecca Nelson is here, so she may have some thing to say about this as I go along. But the, the issue of GMOs, will GMOs become a significant source of food crop productivity growth? And we have a whole chapter on this. And let me, be, let me clarify right up front. I am talking only about GMOs. I'm not talking about the broader biotechnology innovations. I'm not talking about genomics or CRISPR technologies, etc. But primarily just transgenic crops, are they going to make a difference in terms of productivity looking ahead? And, and, and the book comes out saying no, and several reasons for it. And one of the primary reasons for it is that much of the private sector investment in GMO, which is of course the largest part of the investment, takes place primarily for the more industrial crops. So, if you think about the total transgenic crop area in the world, about 95% of it is in four crops. It's in cotton, corn, canola, and soybean. That's it. Those are the four big crops. And then two, uh, two genes, the Bt gene and the herbicide tolerance gene. There hasn't been that much movement beyond that into food crops especially food crops that are important to the poor. Not that there's no research. There's lots of research. There's lots in the pipeline. But a lot of it hasn't moved beyond that and really made an impact on the ground. At the same time, public sector R&D on transgenic has been extremely limited. Public sector played an enormous role in the Green Revolution, both the national public sector as well as the international public sector institutions like the CGIAR, et cetera. But you don't see that public sector investments in, in GM technologies. 
and many reasons for it, including access to technologies, the cost of the technologies, etc. And also, the political nature in which the GM debate has gone into, where um, access to funds to invest in these public sector technologies are also limited. And, and that's been a big issue. And so the, then the chapter argues, well, if that's the case, one can still think about trying to get uh, GM technologies from outside of a country and bring them in and use, adapt them and use them. Uh, the problem with that is most countries don't have the institutional capacity. The institutional capacity to either uh, adapt and disseminate the technologies within their countries and also the institutional capacities for going through the regulatory process. And that's been a big concern. And it continues to be a concern. In fact, the chapter in the book on, on GMOs argues that there are only half a dozen countries that have the capacity to go through from adapting particular technologies to the, through the regulatory process and then the dissemination of these technologies. So it's been, the, we come out fairly negative not on the technology, but on the prospects of the technology being able to move forward. And we, we put the blame squarely on civil society uh, opposition in a way, because civil society opposition to GM has played a big role in the slow movement of GM crops. So that's, I'm sure some of you may have comments on this as we go along. Let me go to the next insight, which is around empowering rural communities. Um, as I said before, the idea that rural communities need to be empowered to, to design their own future, to design uh, their own programs and be part of the governance of these programs is something, uh, while it's obvious to all of us when you think about it, it wasn't development practice until very recently. It wasn't development practice until about, I would say, tw 20 years ago, or even, uh, even later than that, that you began to see this as part of the common parlance of uh, development practice. But it's a crucial part of that practice. And, and one can argue that if without that community involvement, sustainable development is not possible, right? But, the chapter on, on community-driven development also argues that you do see a lot of civil society failures that can also have a big impact on the way communities manage or don't manage development projects. So as economists know about market failures, we know that there are certain areas where markets just don't work. But this chapter actually argues that civil society failures are, are similar in that sense, that a civil society failure could occur where a certain group within the community captures all the benefits of a project, where the rest of the community does not have access to what comes out of the project in terms of improved goods or services or technologies, etc. So that's one part of civil society failure. The other part of civil society failure is discrimination. You can see across the world, across communities, that there is significant discrimination. Discrimination in terms of gender or discrimination by ethnicity, discrimination by color or any type of discrimination. And in the end, the success of a community-driven development program depends a lot on how one manages the discrimination within societies and within communities. And that's a big part of the reason why many of these projects have failed and continue to uh, be at the margin. And, but that's a challenge that one needs to work on. The other challenge, I think, with community-driven development projects or empowering communities is that most rural communities have a very few number of people who actually have the managerial and organizational capacity to, to, to 
manage a community development program. Most of these projects depend on an intermediary NGO that does the work that does the bookkeeping, that does the management behind the scenes, et cetera. And if you take the NGO out, many of these projects have, a, have trouble standing on their own. And that managerial capacity has become a major limiting factor. And longer term, of course, as you build uh, capacity, as, you, as literacy improves, et cetera, you may see that change happening, but right now, we are still in those uh, early days where that continues to be a problem. The, the final point on this is that as you look forward, some of the lessons that we are learning from women's self-help group and the women's self-help group movement that's now thriving uh, both in Asia and in, in Africa and empowering women to be the the, the change agents and the, the agents that manage and govern this community development project would be a way forward, would be something where one would want to look more carefully in terms of both building capacity, but also in the design of future CDD projects. The next uh, insight is around linking agriculture, nutrition, and health. As I said early on, um, agricultural specialists, agricultural economists, etc., have looked at agriculture primarily as a sector. They haven't looked at the intersectoral connection that agriculture has and haven't formalized that into their learnings and into their thinking. It's changing now. It's changing in many places, but certainly Cornell has become a leader in trying to look at that linkages between agriculture and, and the other sectors, primarily look, looking at nutrition and health issues. But if we don't do that, our ability to prioritize agriculture investments become very limited. Because if you look only at the impact of agriculture in terms of production and prices of agriculture products, then in a world as agriculture productivity is increasing overall and as food supplies are increasing overall, the returns to investments in agriculture will by necessity decline. But if you link agriculture to its impact on health or its impact on nutrition, one can see that those returns to investments would be substantially higher. So there's a need, there's a real economic need to make that link. Um, and similarly, it, that nexus between agriculture, water, and sanitation is also under-researched and underrated. Um, and here, again, it's not just investments in agriculture for improving nutrition or health, but you also need to invest in clean water. You need to invest in clean sanitation. And, and how does that nexus work? And what does it take to make it work? And what are the costs of doing that? is a big issue. The third issue around this that we talk about is that it's not just about staple grains, that we need to be looking at agriculture beyond staple grains. And that's something that many of us have been talking about quite significantly, transitioning towards a more nutrition-sensitive food system. Here's my last insight, in case some of you are wondering how much more I'll go through it. <laughs> And this is about the future of international organizations. And, and here, there are two chapters in the, in the book on this. One chapter exclusively on the World Bank, and the second chapter on the CGIAR system. And the World Bank chapter is a really interesting chapter uh, written by Oma Lele, who spent her entire career in the World Bank. Oma Lele, by the way, is a Cornell alum, uh, she got her PhD from, it, it wasn't called the Dyson School in those days, but from the Dyson School. So we are proud of that. Um, so her chapter actually argues that the World Bank played an enormously important role in the early years of the development process, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc., 
when many of the countries in the world today uh, were in the early stages of development, where they were in what we call the early stages of the structural transformation process, where many of these countries were primarily rural societies with high dependence on agriculture as the source of growth and income. Um, think about India or China or Indonesia, uh, Mexico, etc. And, and in, that, in that time period, the World Bank was instrumental in providing the support for the investments needed for infrastructure improvements, irrigation improvements, R&D, etc., which then jump-started the agriculture growth and the structural transformation that happened. And, and much of that happened through soft loan, the soft loan window of the World Bank, the, the IDA window of the World Bank, which provides subsidized um, interest, uh, low interest loans, longer period loans, etc. And, and these countries then moved into middle income status into emerging economy status. And many of them have moved out of being eligible for the subsidized loans. So they're no longer IDA eligible in World Bank language. And that includes countries like India and China, etc. They've all moved beyond that. So what does that mean? It means that you no longer get subsidized uh, interest on your loans, and so your, any loan you get from the World Bank would be similar to the interest you pay in a commercial bank. So once you get into that scenario, then the incentives countries have to take large loans from the World Bank uh, are smaller or are different from when they were in the early stages of the development process. And so what does that mean for the future relationship between the World Bank and these middle-income countries and countries that are moving from to higher middle-income levels, et cetera? It's a really interesting issue to contemplate because if you're not taking a loan, then what are the other services that you're getting from, this, uh, from a major financial institution? So what's the knowledge service that you're getting from the World Bank, uh, which the bank would say is an important part of their activities. But then there are other suppliers of knowledge. There are other suppliers of information uh, and other services like that. So it's an interesting conundrum in a way as you go through that development process. Then of course you have countries where that are still at the lower end of the uh, development process. Many low-income countries, uh, especially uh, the ones in sub-Saharan Africa, are still in the process where they do need that support from the World Bank through the subsidized loan window, the soft loan window, etc. Now what about them? What happens to them? The problem is that the share of World Bank funding that goes to the fundamental infrastructure investment, fundamental agricultural investment, has fallen dramatically. It's fallen from whatever it was, a very large share, to something under 10 percent. So even though the demand for this type of investment may be high among the lowest income countries, the ability of the World Bank to actually supply that uh, demand is becoming increasingly limited. And so, again, that brings about a question about, so how do we look at the future in terms of an organization such as the World Bank, which has had a tremendous influence on the growth process, tremendous impact on the way countries have moved from low income to higher in or middle income levels. So that's, that was the, the chapter on, on the World Bank. Then the chapter on the CGIAR, um, uh, written by Alex McCullough, who was, um, who's sort of been thinking about this for a long time. And, and the argument is quite simple. When the CGIAR was set up, the CGIAR was set up essentially 
to address the problem of hunger. It was set up because you had people who just were massively deficit in, hung in food, uh, massive populations that were hungry, and we needed to find a way to address the problem of hunger in, in countries such as India and China and Indonesia and Bangladesh, etc. And the CJR did a phenomenal job in addressing that problem through uh, improved rice varieties, wheat varieties, maize varieties, etc. Had, had a massive impact on moving that needle on hunger, reduced, dramatically reducing the, the incidence <laughs> of hunger. Now you're looking at a world beyond hunger. You're looking at a world where the challenges are very different. The problems of malnutrition, of not eating the right type of food, is very different from the problem of not having enough food to eat. And then addressing all of the other linkages between food and uh, environmental consequences, the biodiversity consequences, climate change issues, all of this coming together. Uh, one, one asks the question, is an organization that was set up for one purpose able to transition to a very different purpose and, and multiple purposes that we need to address as we look forward? Um, I, there's no answer to the question, but I think the question itself is an important one. And is an organization which has 15 CGIR centers around the world the right type of structure that you need for addressing the problems of food and agriculture today that is so different from what they were in the 1960s when the first of the CGIR centers, Erie, and cement were set up. So it's a challenging question, but it's a question that needs to be asked. And, and more generally, it brings up the idea that the global challenges today are very different. The global challenges today around climate, around nutrition, around diets, non-communicable diseases, etc., are very different from the challenges that were there when the UN and the World Bank and all of these international organizations were set up in the 1950s and 40s. And, and today, we still have the same structure, but the functions are very different. And, and what needs to be addressed is very different. So how do we think about what needs to be addressed and then think back to what's the organizational structure that will allow us to do that? Again, we don't come up with an answer to that question, but we certainly bring it up as something we need to address. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Let me just wrap up by saying, I think it's a great book. <laughs> it, it provides a really good state-of-the-art review of the literature uh, on, the, on the issues that we really think about today, some of the priority development topic, and it'll be a great reference volume, both for students and also for development practitioners. And it, it addresses some of the debates, some of the controversies that we have. But if I had to be critical about, about it myself, uh, because someone's going to bring it up anyway when they review the book, um, if, in retrospect, I wish we had brought in some more around climate change, around the environmental trade-offs, and some of the changing food systems, etc. But we didn't go that far. And part of the reason was we were so focused on looking at areas where Hans Grinswanger had a big impact. And then building on that from when he was working on it up to the time that we had our, our meeting. But the book comes out and shows that the tremendous insight and, and vision that Hans Binswanger had and the tremendous impact that he had on the agricultural economics literature. And for that, we were happy to have brought this all together. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
if you'll wait till I get there with the microphone for your questions, then it will get on the recording. So. Um, Want to sort of take your last comment and your GMO comment. Some of the pressure for accepting GMOs is coming from some of those other factors that you didn't look at. And if you look at even some of the countries in Africa, Uganda, Kenya in particular, the governments are struggling with how to allow these products to move forward and they are making some progress. Again, like many things in these countries, it's slow, but it's, it is happening and you're seeing some of the eggplant acceptance in India, Philippines, and some of that. So it feels like you're unduly pessimistic, or maybe your authors were, with respect to GMO, and want you to maybe elaborate a little further. Sure. Um, and f that, that comment actually came up in the conference also. Um, so it's not that countries are not putting an effort into this, but one would have expected a lot more in terms of actual on-the-ground adoption of food crop-based GM, given the, the enormous potential that it had. Because if you think about around the early 2000s, a lot of the discussion was about how transformative this technology was. Uh, but we haven't seen that happening on the ground. And so that was the, the issue that the chapter was trying to bring up. But one of the things I didn't mention was that even countries that are trying, uh, donor support hasn't been very strong. And there have been many donors, especially uh, some European donors, that have been quite against moving forward on GM technologies in some countries. So that's been a problem. And the CGIR has had the same problem. The CGIR hasn't invested in GM technologies, again, because donor support has been very limited in these areas. Next, Rita. Nope. Yeah, okay. Very nice. I was just wondering about the restructuring of the CGIR. Uh, you said you didn't want to say, you talked about what was wrong with it, but you didn't want to say what your ideas were. So now that we're in a secret meeting, Maybe. <laughs> now that we're in a secret meeting, maybe you could give us some of your ideas on, on how you would restructure it. Oh, absolutely. I may go on record. <laughs> um, so actually, Alex McCullough, in his chapter, talked a little bit about that also. And Bob Hurt, who used to be here, used to talk about this also. Um, so drawing on both of them and with my own thought to that, I would say 15 centers in the CGIR is 10 too many, and that you could come down to five, and have five CGIR centers that can actually focus on global public good research, one on plant science, one on animal science, one on policy, and you can then have one focused on uh, translational research for Sub-Saharan Africa, and then have a fifth, I forgot what the fifth one was going to do, it was something to do with broader natural resource management, uh, climate change, all of that, but looking at it very much from a, uh, high research point of view. So I would go there. And then that would be a world in which national programs are strong to take delivery of these products and adapt it to their own country. If I can make a side comment, uh, when the CGIR was set up people in the 60s, people were saying national institutions are not strong enough, so you need this international body both to develop the technology and disseminate it. We are in 2017, and we still say that. We still say national programs are not strong enough to take the technologies and adapt it to their conditions. And therefore, we still need 
CJIS to do that. Let's start fungible. I think at some point we need to let national institutions take on a lot more of that responsibility. And the CG needs to move back on that. Casual observation, because I'm not an expert in any of these things uh, related to Africa. To one extent, does corruption uh, across uh, these nations discourage uh, investment from a variety of sources and the kinds of things that you believe are necessary to move forward as Africa becomes the largest population growth area of the world in the next 20, 30 years? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's an issue that will come up and has come up, but it was an issue in Asia also that you had very high levels of corruption and how do you manage that? And I think the only way you manage it is to sit through systems that ha have much more transparency. And having systems where you can actually look at fund flows uh, makes a big difference. Uh, democracy makes a big difference in that respect. But modern technology makes a big difference also. I think the whole land grab issue and how uh, powerful governments can allocate large tracts of land to, uh, to individuals or companies uh, can, be man can also be looked at in a more transparent way when you have satellite imagery. So there are ways to think about that. But I must admit we didn't go very far into any of those in the book itself, except the satellite imagery. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.